something that I wanted to try to do, certainly from the very beginning, is actually uh, be a little bit more transparent. You, know, you hear me talk a lot about community policing and building trust. Well, that applies to you too as well. So, you know, uh, you know, sharing information, at least talking to you a little bit more about what we're doing or experiencing and taking some of your questions in a non-crime uh, scene environment, I think is important. And so uh, many of the things that we do, we clearly partner with the city and the mayor around that. That's why the mayor's here. She may not always be available for these press conferences, but uh, I think it's certainly fitting that she's here today. We have a lot of uh, things coming up this week, starting with a storm, <laughs> starting with a storm, and then, of course, at the end of next week, we have St. Patrick's Day coming up as well. So I wanted to cover a few of those topics. Um, before we begin, you know, typically we, we've started a, more recently a, a community concept in the communities, and, and we usually do an overview of crime, crime in the city in general. And today, uh, we have representative from the BRIC to just give a little overview of that. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Carabin. I serve as the director of the Boston Regional Intelligence Center here at Boston Police Department. Um, as you may know, uh, we wrapped up uh, 2022 on a good note. Our uh, part one crime statistics were the lowest recorded since 2006. And based on available data, these were the lowest part one crime total statistics recorded uh, since the late 1950s. So as we've begun uh, 2023, overall our part one crime has decreased by 8%, so an additional decrease, we're trending in the right direction, uh, right through yesterday. Uh, violent crimes have decreased 9% or 54 incidents, and property crimes have decreased 8% or 164 incidents. Rape incidents have declined by nearly one third compared to this time last year. And additionally, non-domestic aggravated assaults have declined by a quarter. We've seen significant decreases um, observed in several property crime categories. That includes commercial burglary, down 46%, residential burglary, down 21%, and vehicle breaks, down 17%. Part one crimes have also decreased 8% year to date compared to the five year average with violent crime down 10%. That's over 200 part one crime incidents and 65 violent crime incidents. The two categories with an increase to date this year are homicide and robbery. Just both, both are just slightly above their five-year averages. We've calculated a total of 10 homicides in 2023 and 151 robberies. We've seen arrests de decrease uh, nearly 12% compared to our five-year average at this point in the year. And our shooting incidents have increased by seven with nine additional victims year to date. Total shooting, total shooting victims are five above the five-year average, and we continue to work towards those issues. Commissioner? Thank you very much. That was David Carabin, uh, Director of uh, Boston Regional Intelligence Center. And so clearly crime is um, down in, in most categories. However, homicide and shootings are up, and that is something we are certainly working to address as we partner again with the community to make sure uh, we are informed uh, you know, when these things happen and actually make sure we have officers in place to prevent them in the first place. Uh, so we will take some questions at the end of this, but I'm just going to continue on and, and talk about our preparations for the upcoming St. Patrick's Day uh, parade. Uh, the parade is going back to the traditional route, much longer route than we've had before in the past. And so we're asking for the public uh, to enjoy this family friendly holiday, which is, is, you know, become more so than what it was in the past. And we want to make sure it stays that way. Uh, so we're asking people, if they do come into the city, uh, to be cognizant of, of this is a family-friendly event. To uh, you know, We're not going to be allowing uh, public drinking uh, and to be aware of, uh, you know, the activities around drinking in general that day. We ask parents to certainly be aware of the, you know, the young people's uh, activities and where they are as well, uh, as a lot of people come from outside of the city in on the team uh, to come to the event. And so, you know, we are looking for some partnership with adults and anyone who has, uh, they, they may be concerned about people coming into the city drinking. Uh, that, that is something that we're asking us, others to be aware of. We will have offices uh, along the route and working with the state police and all our partners, the MBTA police, state police, and um, uh, 
our federal partners to make sure that this is a safe event in general and we will be monitoring all activities regarding public safety uh, for this coming event. Uh, the, the bars uh, and, and actually the, um, the uh, um, liquor establishments are, will be closing early, particularly in the area at 4 p.m. and we thank them for uh, providing that service to us to make sure that the, uh, this event does stay family friendly in general. Uh, there have been a recent uptick in, in people around drinks and drink spiking. So again, this is why we, we not only discourage public drinking, we, we're not going to allow it, but more so importantly to remind people to be aware of the activities uh, around this, uh, around public spiking of drinks in general. Um, beside this event coming up, I know we do have some weather that we may want to talk about. Mayor, I don't know if you want to take a moment to talk about that now. No. Yeah, if you've done some here. I'm just here to, to back up the commissioner <laughs> and thank him. Um, this is truly his, his idea he's been talking about for a while of wanting to make sure that there was space to highlight all of the good work happening across the police department and our public safety efforts and um, to create a chance to have, have you all have the, have, have the chance to ask um, any questions at all. So I want to thank, I mean, there's some, some folks in, in the room also um, before we get into the weather. Um, thank you to all of our BPD, well, thank you to Dave Caravan for a great presentation and for keeping us updated, um, helping us measure what's happening in, in all the various ways that we, we track the numbers. Um, I want to thank members of the command staff who are here also, just a great resource uh, for us at the city alongside the commissioner from Chief Long, uh, Superintendent Cullinan, Superintendent Cologne. Um, we have our senior advisor for public safety, Isaac Yablo, here as well. Um, everyone, everyone working hand in hand. And uh, of course, thank you to um, Jessica, Mary Ellen, and Tiffany, and, and everyone else. Oh, and she is hiding. <laughs> but um, um, the amazing uh, brand new chief of staff to Commissioner Cox, Nicole uh, Talbot, already making a big difference for the city. So um, a quick update. The weather forecasts are still shifting around quite a bit. Uh, our public works and emergency management and Boston Public Schools teams are, are really focused on tracking this minute by minute as we think about decisions and whether there is going to be an impact on school for tomorrow. Our latest estimates from a range of providers have anywhere from a three to four inch uh, snow prediction to upwards of you know closer to, to six or seven. The time frame has it coming down for now, again, changing rapidly potentially starting around noontime, but what all of the forecasts have across the various predictor, um, various estimates is very high winds. Um, and so we are just, we've been in touch with companies who might be running some of our cranes and, and other large scale construction projects to be aware, secure all of the um, materials and equipment. And we also are keeping that as my, in mind as we um, think about what will happen tomorrow. We know that um, the temperatures won't be uh, dangerously cold, but the, the, the real question will be when the snow begins, how fast it comes down, um, and, and we will look to see when that timing lines up because many of our buses start getting on the roads for pickup and, and dismissal time right around 1 p.m. So if it all kind of clusters then with uh, a lot of snow coming down fast and heavy winds, um, we're just monitoring that to see what will happen, and uh, we'll be back with potential updates later today on that front. Thank you, Baron. A couple other items I just wanted to briefly touch. Uh, there's been a little news and I mean, uh, information out there around missing persons. And I, what I want to make clear, certainly, is the public out there about when they should report someone missing. I want to make sure that there's not, you know, there's no unclarity around this. If someone is missing and they're concerned about a loved one, that they should report it to us right away, particularly if there's uh, a, a young age involved or some type of cognitive um, issue at hand or, or age uh, regarding that person. Um, I, we've received some information out that people are confused about waiting, how long they should wait. Uh, you don't have to wait at all. If you have reason to believe the person is missing and you're fairly sure about their, their missing status, report it to us right away because time is important and, and we will take that information and actively start uh, looking for, for your loved one uh, immediately around that. So uh, we may start to take some other questions here. Um, I know we are doing a few other things, but the idea around this is not uh, a press conference only around bad stuff, but eventually uh, so we can start up about what we're doing on a daily basis. We do so many good things, particularly around community policing with springtime coming up. We're working with youth 
uh, uh, you know, having programs, uh, working with youth. You know, the city talked about a potentially a jobs program for kids. Well, our department, as well as the city in general, does so many positive things, but yet we sometimes don't like to talk about some of those. So we want to actually have these more routinely so you're more aware of what we're actively doing and more importantly answer your questions directly. Some of the things that I have seen out there is that for some reason if you don't hear from us, almost anybody's an authority on policing issues and, and that's really just not appropriate. <laughs> so um, I, I, that's why I think it's important to do these way more routinely than what we've been doing. Friday is St. Patrick's Day, as you mentioned. Um, can you talk? You talked a little bit about drink spiking. Can you talk a little bit about some of the department's efforts to stop that? How you go about that? And also, last year we did see some white supremacist activity. Is that something you can address, and how do you handle that? So the drink spiking, we certainly have, have been in contact with many of the, the bar owners and, and club owners in general, and they've been quite responsive. And whether they put lids on the drinks or, or, or certainly making sure that patrons understand the issue, and you all have been quite good at reporting out on these issues in general. And that's that's the important thing: is awareness, uh, particularly uh, younger adults as they you know drink, college students, things of that nature. As long as they're aware about their drinks and not leaving them open to the public for people to do that. I think that's the important part is that people do that do this for some strange reason. We will prosecute anybody that we find and capture um, uh, who has done this, certainly. But in the meantime, we just want people to stay safe and be cognizant of their drinks and making sure they're covered. Uh, I prefer on St. Patrick's Day in general, and particularly out in public, not to drink at all. Right? That's, that's what my preference is. On the second front, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a hate group or anyone who comes into the city that wants to do harm or interrupt our daily lives. Or, you know, they are on our radar, and we will address it appropriately. Uh, I certainly don't want to give attention to people who don't need attention, but the reality is we are prepared for uh, almost anything, and that's what we prepare for in general. So uh, I don't know if, if those folks will return, but either way, we'll be prepared, and, and we will treat everyone um, constitutionally regardless of who they may be. This is a beloved tradition in the city and one that's very much tied to the history of our immigrant communities and, and the history of uh, particular revolutionary war sites in, in the development of um, this country. And so we're very grateful to the Boston Police for taking on the additional um, staffing and, and resources and intense planning that's required to return to a longer traditional route that does go by many more of these historical sites in the parade. And we've been working very closely with community members even as recently as Friday evening um, together with the, some of the parade organizers and fellow uh, leaders in, in the community at all levels of, of elected office and um, public safety agencies just to make sure that everybody's continuing to coordinate and, and be ready. Are you worried about the tea, the fact that it's, it's now, you have to add an additional 20 minutes onto your commute, now you're going to have how many people in Boston for St. Patrick's Day? I could have a whole briefing every single day on the T, uh, just of, of all of the urgency that there is to make sure this basic infrastructure gets the resources that it needs to be fixed. I know we are making strides there. I know these changes take time because it's been many, many decades of deferred maintenance, but it has been particularly frustrating to see uh, it's a feeling of no end in sight when it comes to when our public transportation service will be reliable and accessible, dependable for everyone. Um, I know the governor and the interim general manager, or the department of, uh, secretary of transportation, everybody is on the same page about how fast we should be going and they're doing everything they can uh, to address the many, many factors about infrastructure and fixing the tracks and getting the staffing up. Um, here is an example of you know, whether it is for the snow call that we will make uh, later today potentially, depending on, on how the forecasts change, or uh, the parade and how people are making their own decisions about whether they can come into the city and how to get there and um, what they can rely on. This is a major factor in everything that we do. 
we have been in touch with the MBTA, um, both in the sort of leadership level and in some of the public safety conversations. The MBTA police, transit police, have been at the table and incredibly engaged. They have assured us that th this is on their radar as a very big, important, large-scale event, and so they know that we need to have special care here. Um, and so, you know, rest assured, we still encourage everyone to take public transportation to access the neighborhood and, and large-scale events, just so you don't get stuck in people and traffic and, and all of that. Um, and we will keep our fingers crossed as we continue to fight for uh, more resources, for Boston to have a direct say on the MBTA, and for all of us to have the public transit system well, that we deserve. The city continues to try to get back, get back from the pandemic, and we're starting to get talk about a possible recession looming perhaps in the next year or so. How much of a negative impact is the T operating today on the city's economy right now? How much is that negatively impacting the city's economy? There are two factors that are make or break for our economy and whether we will continue to be a city that leads the way for innovation and jobs and quality of life, it is housing and transportation. I hear it from every single one of our businesses that they are losing workers who can't afford to live in the city or they are not sure if they can get their workers to come in person to the office because of stress or concerns about the transportation system. And so um, the wonderful news is that we have a state administration that is fully on board with moving fast on this. Two leaders and the governor and the lieutenant governor who know these issues very well, who are completely committed to putting the resources behind them, both to boost the uh, housing supply that we have, to make sure there's more affordable housing, and to get going much more quickly on the transportation front. We're in regular communication with them at the city level and um, share everything from our dreams at a, at a big picture scale for how we build the, the foundation for our economy to, to really grow and, and be that example across the country, but also on a day-to-day -day basis, issues about how we're preparing or um, as we prepare for inclement weather, the exact intersections that the city's public works teams and the MBTA staff are coordinating around who will clear the snow from, from these exact locations. So we're, we have a great working relationship and we all need to do more. Um, I was on the green line today and you can feel the slow zones uh, above ground. You know, luckily I, I didn't, I saved plenty of time for myself, but even getting to the, the first thing you see, there was a train that was just sitting there um, out of service because of a schedule adjustment. We didn't get going for a, a good, I don't know, almost five to 10 minutes. Um, and, and then just kind of crawling, crawling over some of the stops. There were several people, you know, I'm, I'm in my, <laughs> I couldn't run today, but there were several people who, when they heard the train was going to be delayed for an unforeseen period of time, just had already tapped their card, had already gotten on, and decided they were just going to get off and walk to their location anyway. So we feel that sense of frustration all across our community. Um, this is a big picture economic issue. It is an individual sort of physical stress and emotional health issue for, for many of our community, commuters and family members just trying to get home to their families on time. Um, and I know there's the collective energy to do something about it, and it's a matter of moving fast to do it. On the missing persons issue, the governor has suggested um, wanting to create a, a statewide um, unit to help you know, local districts, local police districts um, investigate missing persons. I wonder if you thought about that, and also have looked at the, at the Boston Police specifically, how they handle that, is, it, is there a better way to handle that? Specifically with this, um, in reference to this incident with a woman in East Boston who's gone missing, the frustration her family had around that. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, you know, I think the important thing around the, the, the last thing you just made comment is that, you know, that person is found hopefully safe or we find out, you know, exactly who it is that may have harmed that individual. Um, we've been working on that case since day one. And, and, and like with all investigations, there's always more that you could do, you know, but the fact is we've been working very hard and, and we hope that she gets here safely. And I, sometimes I, I just want to make the message, you know, clear. We need the public's help in finding out where she is, or who might have her, because that's the focus of the story, really. It's like that we're here to help find her 
and um, you know, and, and we're going to do all we can to make sure that happens. As far as the state, you know, bringing a unit to help other local municipalities, I, I think that's always a good thing. I, I would say all police departments need more resources. Uh, we are asked to do many, many things, and we don't always have enough people to do all of those things. So investigations are difficult. They can be long. They take a lot of work in general. So anytime someone wants to support any municipality in, in doing investigations, particularly around missing persons, I think that support is helpful. But can you say, is, that, is that investigation ongoing still, or yes. what's the status of it? Uh, the investigation is ongoing. I asked for the public's help, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, that's where I want to keep the focus. I don't know how we became the focus. The reality is, is there's a missing person out there and that we need some support and help and help and locate the person. So just on, on this point, I want to thank the commissioner and the department um, for working very closely. The Office of Police Accountability and Transparency, OPAT, has been working with the department to ensure that our, all of our policies at the city level reflect the reality of, of what we see today. We know there is a nationwide um, very troubling trend where um, women and often women of color, particularly from immigrant communities or in multilingual communities, um, when, when they are missing, there is an additional sense of fear from families, uh, mistrust and, and concern about government in general. And so we have been working um, not only to support and, and back up the department's hard work on, on this particular investigation, but to ensure that our community at large has those strong relationships with the Boston police and, and with the city um, to, to be able to address larger issues and, and um, build that connection beyond a single investigation as well, whether it is working to ensure that our materials are put out in multiple languages, including to media outlets that are um, covered in, in languages other than English, or to be very clear about when the policies are where, where information is released to the public. Um, the commissioner and OPAT, or Stephanie Everett, our OPAT director, have been taking the lead on that. Commissioner, can you talk a little bit about police resources? You have a big full-length parade coming up. You have a department that's down a couple hundred officers. So does that concern you when you have those two things colliding? And then what's sort of the state of trying to help the staffing issue that we so, you know, we are currently, you know, certainly trying to enlist probably one of the largest classes we ever had come, coming up this spring to help, you know, uh, alleviate some of the pressure of, of having so many retirements and people, you know, attrition loss. Uh, as far as a major event like this, whether it's this event, the marathon, um, it takes all our department resources to do it. And, and it's a traditional thing, so it's not like something that just came out of the blue. Uh, we probably haven't done it uh, in the full fashion that we're doing coming up this week in, in a while, but it's something we've had to hit, deal with before. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing all we can to increase our numbers, um, but we're also doing all we can to make sure that this is a place where people want to come and work. And, and again, this is where we need some help and assistance. Yeah. This is a wonderful job. We do a tremendous amount of work for the public. We need it in so many different ways. We just always need to make sure the narrative about what we do and how we do it is reflected accurately. You know, that, that's all I asked about about some of that. Uh, you know, to make sure that this is always a, a place where young people want to join to help because that is all we're here to do. Right? Our mission is to serve the public, and that's all we do day in and day out. But along the way, um, there's been a, you know certainly a loss of, of love for this job. You know, like certainly in the way that I that I see it. We do so many positive things, but yet it's hard to attract people. It's hard to get people to stay on board. So, um, I know you've called for lateral transfers. Has there been any discussion about getting rid of the residency requirement, for example? So the residency, certainly, you know, that's the, the, the discussion with, with, with us, us and the mayor. Again, I, I, even if we did, I don't know how much of an impact that that would be right now. We, we need to make sure people understand that this is a job in which we we give back to the society that we live. We are here to do good things in that the fact is, is this is a well-run police department uh, in, in the greatest city in America. You know, those, the combination of those things you would think of wanting to attract people, but we're, we are fighting a tough tide right now in general, and we're doing all we can to make sure people understand what this job is, who we're here to serve, uh, so we can make it attractive, so we don't have issues around uh, retention.
I just, I am so um, filled with gratitude and hope about the direction of community policing in Boston and um, the close ties between our police department and everything else that is happening in the city. Our officers on a daily basis come into contact with families from every background, speaking every language, and sometimes they are that first connection point to services. We were in this room not too long ago celebrating and thanking several officers who on a, I think it was a, maybe a routine traffic stop or, or I um, realized that that family um, didn't have housing in just the, the quick conversation and went so above and beyond to make sure that they got connected to the right services and had a warm place to stay that night, just way outside the, the sort of usual job description of how people think about what officers are doing. That is the work of the police department every day. A couple days ago, the commissioner and I and, and many in this room were at the promotional ceremony for sergeants and lieutenants and to see folks who have put in, it was 13, officers who were being promoted representing more than 250 years of experience on the job and now moving into a supervisory role to help shape the next generation. Um, a few weeks, weekends before that, I was at uh, the pre-academy training program that JGO, um, the Latino Law Enforcement Group, runs and that just as part of their community service they work with young people who are trying to even get ready to get into the academy to get ready to become officers and the sense of commitment and excitement in that room to join this first and finest police force in the country was was palpable people were thrilled and excited and it was faces from the, who i recognize from our um, City Hall Municipal Protective Services who wanted to make that jump. It was uh, community members who had a, a first generation applying for the job, others who were sons or daughters of someone who served in public safety. And so we're really, the work that the commissioner and the department are doing to build ties every day with community is about keeping people safe right now and responding in those moments where you don't know who to call except for our officers will, will go and provide whatever help they possibly can. But it's also ensuring that we're creating good jobs in our city, that we are tying people into all of the city services that are available and, and that often this department becomes the hub for. Thank How you, everyone. How many people are you planning to will come into the city on Friday? How many people are you planning to Range, we'll take a range. No, but it's obviously it's in the hundreds of thousands. Why don't we follow up and see what it was? Yeah. Yes, we'll, we'll find it. We'll what did you say about 4 o'clock closing? What day is that? Is it what, bars or restaurants? Bars and restaurants. Yeah, are, no, 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 the, uh, the that's liquor stores. Liquor stores in the liquor area. Stores. Yes. Sunday in South Park. South. How hard a time Sunday. would you have Sunday. filling up the 200-person group class? This What's the so question? Awesome. How, hard a, How hard a time did you have getting on the repeat? So I think we're, we're going to accomplish that, but the fact of the matter is is that you know, uh, we do serious vetting when it comes to police work. So, to get 200, we have to go through quite a number of people, right? Because there's, you know, um, some people, you know, do their history or whatever, they, they probably wouldn't be appropriate for policing. And so, we always need a much larger number just to, uh, uh, you know, get the goal number that we're looking for at the time. So, can you describe you. just really quickly? Yeah, that was the last yeah. question. I think for Mayor, 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 Mayor,